Good evening, everyone. Um, we would like to start, and people can just join in as they come along. Uh, yeah, I would uh, like to welcome you all um, on behalf of um, the SOAS Open Economics Forum, especially our two speakers who will be introduced to you um, by Christina in a minute. Um, I would just very briefly want to take this opportunity to introduce you to um, who we are, uh, meaning our society. Um, in general, we are concerned with a um, heterodox and pluralistic approach to economics. Um, this means challenging orthodox thinking, for example, and um, we have been involved in two main campaigns throughout the UK. One is Rethinking Economics, which is basically um, a campaign striving for more um, plurality, pluralism um, in economics curriculum, curricula in universities, and the second is um, democratize economics, which aims at making economics more accessible to non-economists, as we believe it is um, essential for democracy that also non-economists can get involved in the political and uh, the public in public discourse concerning economics, economic topics. And yeah, that's basically all for me. Okay. I hope we have a good event and a good discussion afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thanks Ruben. Uh, good afternoon everybody I'm, uh, and welcome to the Open Economics Forum's uh, event. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this talk today on uh, the fundamental character of the EU and ultimately its desirability. Um, we will be covering issues about these basic rules that govern the EU, uh, who makes these rules up, who do the EU rules apply to and when, and in whose benefit do these fundamental rules change. Um, we hope to cover a broad range of issues. Uh, our, uh, our two speakers uh, have been asked to answer a, a series of questions, which I'll just uh, repeat in just a moment. Um, so what we are trying to ask is how do we interpret these different dilemmas between democracy and technocracy, uh, which we see at the heart of Europe? Um, and how do we interpret uh, these violations that we see uh, of various socio-economic rights, also at the heart and at the fringes uh, in particular. Uh, what is this Europe really like that, um, you know, in, in words uh, says you can vote for whoever you like, um, but in practice tells those in power exactly what they have to do? So is this common currency compatible with democracy? Is this common currency compatible with any other policy program except austerity? So to help us navigate these uh, broad, complex issues, um, we're truly delighted to have these two distinguished speakers with us. Uh, Martin Sanfu has been writing for the Financial Times since 2009, uh, joining as the newspaper's economics leader writer, and he currently writes the Free Lunch Daily uh, Global Briefing. Uh, his editorial responsibilities cover macro, uh, the euro crisis, financial regulatory reform, so all topics which are very important for our, our discussion today. Um, his previous experience includes working and studying at top academic institutions, including Oxford, Harvard, Columbia, and um, Pennsylvania's Wharton School. And he's worked as an advisor for governments and NGOs on economic uh, resource, natural resource management. Um, and he's the, he's a lead commentator on the EU crisis. We're delighted to have him with him. He's got a, a recent book called Europe's Orphan: The Future of the Euro and the Politics of Debt. So welcome, Martin. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're also delighted to have John Hillary with us today. Um, John Hillary is the Executive Director of War and Want, a large NGO based here in the UK. You might be, uh, might be aware of it. Um, he has worked in global justice movement for the past 25 years and published widely on issues of globalisation, trade policy and workers' rights. Uh, the recent report on the transatlantic trade, his recent report on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, also known as TTIP, uh, has been published now in over uh, 12 European languages um, and supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, in John, uh, in, you, might, you might remember John was last at SOAS actually to talk about the TTIP agreement in the autumn term. Um, in, in 2013, John was appointed honorary professor of politics and international relations at the University of Nottingham. And uh, his recent publications include The Poverty of Capitalism, Economic Meltdown, and The Struggle for What Comes Next, published by Pluto Press. Um, 
And a second title includes the Free Trade and Transnational Labour, recent publications, uh, again, very close to the global broad issues that we're going to be covering today. So big thank you to both of the speakers um, for being here to help us uh, go through these issues. So um, the three sort of orientating questions that we wanted to focus on for today's topic were, um, is the EU suffering from a democratic deficit? Uh, and the most important one, are democratic concessions a necessary component of economic integration? Um, and to bring it back home, as in to bring it back to domestic um, policy concerns of the, of the current moment, how does this reflect on the concerns raised in the UK referendum debate? So uh, we will, uh, each speaker will take up to 20 minutes to go over their views, present their, their points of view, and then we will have plenty of time to open it up to the floor for questions and answers and a discussion. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start with um, John Hillary and move on to Martin afterwards. So thank you. Is it too loud? entirely sure that you can hear me a lot. So I'm going to stand up, because that way at least I'll be able to protect my voice. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be back at SOAS. I did my master's degree at SOAS in a previous century, um, looking at Chinese politics and economics. So I've always had a very um, nice feeling towards being back, whether here or in Russell Square. And uh, I should just say, the only reason I was made a, a, an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham is that they have this honorary professorship, which is part of the university's ongoing scheme, usually to attract very high-profile diplomats and, and sort of captains of industry. And there is a Marxist group in the University of Nottingham who are fed up with it always being people from the right. So they asked me to be an honorary professor to get somebody to balance out this imbalance. Uh, and that's really where it comes from, rather than anything else. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to speak on the, on the issue of the European Union, and I want to just start by saying why War on Want um, has been involved in this, why, why are we interested at all in talking about the European Union at this time. We're an organisation which does focus on the root causes of injustice and inequality, so we do tackle political issues as a matter of course, but there's no particular reason you might think that we want to get involved with the European Union referendum debate. And indeed, I should start by saying we're not running a campaign to promote people either to come in or to, to vote to go out. Our real point in engaging in this debate was to deepen people's understanding of what on earth the European Union is. I think we're probably in a room where you've got more understanding than most people will have. But 99.9% .9 of British people have never, ever had any direct experience of the institutions of the EU. And so it's really a debate which is taking place at a, at a very sort of shallow or more intuitive level about whether you like the idea of being European. And I should say from the absolute outset, I do like the idea of being European rather than being English or British. I'm totally aware of the horrific history of Europe in the world, 500 years of colonial plunder of every other country on the globe, simply in order to ensure that Europe has a nicer standard of living than anybody else. But even with that, despite everything, I do still prefer to see myself as European. We're not being asked in this referendum whether we want to be European or not. You might think we are, because a lot of people, when you hear, oh, it's really nice to do things together, we'd like to do things with our European neighbours, that's not what you're being asked. You're not being asked whether Britain can be towed out into the Atlantic and park next to Iceland or something like that, you're being asked whether you want to be subject to the institutions of the European Union. And that's a much more particular question which I want to talk to. And in a way, it's a question which pits your heart against your head. If you want to vote because you have a warm, fuzzy feeling about being European, you should vote in. But what we're trying to do is say there are some specific reasons, much more hard-headed reasons, why you need to look carefully at the institutions of the European Union and what they mean, both in terms of these questions 
which Christina read out on democracy, but also in terms of the political and economic and social program of the European Union. And this is a particular desire to, to re-educate the left. The left in this country has laboured under a bit of, bit of a misapprehension or perhaps a, an older view of what the European Union is. And we put something on our website, a much longer explanation of this. Um, if we put it up on the 1st of January this year to mark the anniversary of Britain having joined the EEC, as it then was, the European Economic Community, or the Common Market, in the 1st of January 1973, which means I, at least, maybe not terribly many other people in this room, but I was born into a Britain which was not a member of the European Union, which is perhaps why I don't feel so scared. Because it was okay. Anyway, history. For people on the left, they still look back, I think, to the way in which the European Union was portrayed in the 1980s. And I want to start one decade back for that, because in 1975, as you may know, the UK did have its last referendum on whether or not we would be members of the European Union, as it still was then, the EEC. And the left in this country, by and large, said, we do not believe in this capitalist club. That was the way in which it was described at the time. It is a club which has been set up by capital for capital. And so all of the trade unions in this country said we want to vote out. The Labour Party had a special session of its conference just two months before the June 1975 referendum. And by a margin of two to one, the Labour Party said we want to vote out. And the current, um, the, the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, he was forced to allow his cabinet members to campaign on both sides of the debate in exactly the same way as Cameron does now. So it's a little bit rich when you hear some of the Labour um, shadow cabinet accusing Cameron of not showing leadership. You just have to look back to 1975 and exactly the same thing happened there. And I think it's completely right, <coughs> completely right that there should be that freedom. So in the 1970s, the left was basically in favour of going out and the right was in favour of going in. And in the 1975 referendum, the right won. And it said, OK, we will confirm Britain's place in the European Union. Fast forward to 1988, and the left was in the crisis of Thatcherism. A whole decade of this massive onslaught of extreme right policies destroying the power of the trade unions in this country. And at that moment, Jacques Delors came over to Britain to address the TUC, the Trade Union Congress, at its 1988 Congress. And this is quite a sort of seminal moment in the history of left or centre-left views of the European Union. And Jacques Delors at that time was promoting EMU, the European Economic and Monetary Union, in the run-up to the Maastricht Treaty, which of course was his great legacy. And the way in which he did this was to say, yes, we recognise that Economic and Monetary Union is very much a program in favour of capital. It's been asked for, it's, it's, it's delivering for capital what it wants to see in the European Union to wit free movement of capital and um, deregulation of the capital controls and other boundaries which still existed. But he said, at the same time, we have a vision of a social <coughs> Europe to go alongside this capitalist Europe. And he sold that very strongly and the trade unions in this country absolutely bought into it. They said, look, we're being slaughtered by Thatcherism. We look across the channel, and in fact, the European Union does look a kinder, more gentle, more socially acceptable, more socially progressive place. And from that moment on, the left, or the centre-left certainly in this country, has been much more pro-European. And it's why now you'll find very little open dissent from the left in relation to this current referendum. But that was then. And in the time since the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, immediately after, yes, you did get some positive progressive directives coming out of the European Union on maternity and paternity pay, on rights for part-time workers, on rights for agency workers, on rights for temporary workers, on the environmental side as well. You'll see from the Green Party's current um, political manifestos and things, it was very good for beaches. The water in our beaches got better, things like that. But since then, the European Union has radically changed. 
And certainly since 2000, when the Lisbon Agenda came in, and since 2009, when the Lisbon Treaty came in, it's completely reversed that consideration of the European social model, which held the idea of a customs union, a free trade zone, alongside the European social model. Now, the European social model is completely dead. Everybody recognizes that from Brussels all the way across the whole of the European Union. And in its place, we have this hard-nosed drive to pause towards competitiveness. And competitiveness, that's rather hard to say in English, is the buzzword which has really led the European Union since the year 2000 and before that. And it is, in fact, I think, there that you can begin to see the technocratic element within it. Because it's as if the politics of the European Union has been sucked out of it. And instead, this professionalised, technocratic solution to the problems of Europe has been put in its place. And you can see that for, for, in various different forms. Um, when Peter Mandelson, who was the European Trade Commissioner sent over there from Britain, was in charge from 2006, he introduced the concept of global Europe. So instead of social Europe, which was the thing which the left all bought into, you had global Europe. Global Europe said, we want to have a hard-nosed, that's their, their word, a hard-nosed approach to furthering the interests of capital across the world and in Europe itself. Across the world, through all of the trade treaties, the raw materials initiatives, all of the investment agreements which pushed open new markets for European capital and tried to restrict, uh, remove any of the restrictions on its operations. And internally, within Europe at the same time, this agenda which is now called the Better Regulation Agenda. This idea that you want to minimise the burden on business, the burden on capital in its operations within Europe, just as you do outside Europe. And the focus is squarely on what is good for business. And what happens to the environment or to social standards comes a very, very, very low subordinate second. For us at Warren as Christina says, we're particularly looking at the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, which is another logical conclusion of exactly this same program. We've left lots of bits of material, badges, stickers, anything you like to take with you. I'm not taking them back to my office, so do take as many as you can carry with you. I won't go too much into TTIP. But TTIP is exactly this same program of deregulation in favour of capital. It's not like an old-style trade treaty, which was about reducing tariffs at the border between bananas or steel or coffee or computers. It's about reaching behind the border and re-engineering our economic and our social space in favour of capital. And that is where the European Union is. So when we were describing the European Union in, in this piece we put up on our website, we sort of wanted to pay homage to Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood, so we called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good was the introduction of some of the <coughs> more progressive directives in the post-Maastricht era. The bad was the turn towards global Europe and this very dramatic, technocratic, pro-capitalist extreme agenda. The ugly bit goes to the heart of this discussion, and that is the huge democratic deficit right at the heart of the European Union. And I don't think people can really quite gauge this unless they've had direct experience of it. The institutions of the European Union have a particular valence, a particular force that our civil service and other institutions here do not have. The European Commission, which we might equate to our civil service here, is not like our civil service here. The European Commission has its own independent right of initiative. It is the body which can initiate new legislative powers, new directives, new regulations, and then pass that through to the other bodies to approve, usually just to rubber stamp, because the European Parliament, for example, doesn't have the opportunity to open up and to criticise a lot of these things. It just gets a yes-no vote on TTIP and, and other things like that. But I think it was last year that people really became aware 
of the limits to democracy by being within the European Union. And that was because of the crisis in Greece. And the Greek people said quite clearly, we believe in an alternative to this politics of permanent austerity coming out of the European Commission, out of the European Central Bank, both of them unelected, both of them unaccountable. And it was the way in which, I think it wasn't just the response, but the way in which the central European institutions responded that sent shivers down the spines of most people across Europe. When Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, was asked about the situation in Greece, he said, you mustn't confuse dreams with reality. There can be, quote unquote, there can be no democratic choice against the European treaties. The Lisbon Treaty, this is not him anymore, this is now me, the Lisbon <laughs> Treaty had said that you no longer have the right as sovereign states of the European Union to challenge the central tenets of that treaty. That's what it made clear, and that's basically the binding situation going forward. And interestingly, I think, you know, it's not just the European Commission in this respect, it's also the President of the European Parliament, the one elected body within the European Union, who said exactly the same thing. Martin Schulz, German Social Democrat, when he was asked about the Greek situation, he specifically said, the people of Greece need to remove the Syriza government. We need to impose in its place a technocratic administration to administer the demands of the Central European institutions until a new and more mollient and more susceptible um, government can be put in place. And you then see the same thing rolled out in the five presidents report, which you may have read from last year. Schultz, the only elected one, Juncker from the Commission, Draghi from the ECB, uh, Turk as the Euro Summit, um, Tusk rather as the Euro Summit um, head, and Gislebon, who I can never really pronounce anyway, but head of the Euro Group, which is the least transparent group of all of them. And I think this is where I've been, you know, when I was looking at the sort of the, 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 the background to this debate coming out of Habermas's book of the lure of technocracy. It's very interesting how there is a particular view of this from within the German situation. I don't know how many Germans we have in the room. I feel I can be a little bit rude about Germans because my mother's family came from Germany, so you know, I'm not being totally uh, nasty about it. But it is fascinating how the view from Germany of Europe is a very particular view, which the Germans don't recognize how German it sounds to everybody else and how brutal it sounds. And it was interesting being in Greece at the time of these debates last year and seeing the level of antipathy towards the German response to the Greek people was extraordinary. Armed guards around the German embassy to protect it because of the violence that the people of Greece felt that the German people were doing to them. Habermas, I think, is completely correct in pointing out that there is a crisis of legitimacy at the absolute heart of Europe. I think that is absolutely unmistakable, whether you're on the left or the right. The European Union institutions are facing their greatest crisis of legitimacy at the moment. I don't think he is correct in saying that somehow we can transcend this through a super European identity which boosts democracy by raising the status of the European Parliament to that of the European Council and everything's going to be okay. I think he still sees the European Union through the prism of international relations, which I think is completely wrong. Whether it's in terms of the, the internal or the external program of the European Union, you can only understand it through the prism of political economy. That this is transnational capital uniting with capitalists outside in order to try to reprogram the European project to their benefits and to their ends. And you won't be able to counter that by however many new institutions you put up in its place at all. And the creation of a United States of Europe is actually just going straight back to the technocratic, or in the German view, the ordo liberal approach, whereby you don't need to have politics anymore. You don't believe in any class struggle or any 
competitive um, clash of interests because suddenly it's all going to be there. Internally, austerity Europe. Externally, fortress Europe. And unfortunately, this is where it links to the UK referendum because, of course, here, very sadly, the only way in which we're debating this is how we can have more open markets and more closed borders. So when Cameron goes over into the rest of Europe and su succeeds in securing his so-called compromise with, our, with the other member states of Europe, all he's doing is feeding in to a pre-existing desire for more and more open markets, getting rid of any of the regulations and the standards and the rules which we believe are really important, and instead raising the borders to anybody trying to come in from the outside. And that's why we've argued very passionately, whatever, whatever the result of the referendum, we must be insisting from within on the in inalienable right of refugees to find asylum within Europe and the absolute responsibility of our countries to provide that asylum. So I just want to, to finish by sort of maybe raising one more hopeful sign because at the same time as all of these crises have rolled across the European Union over the past two, three, four years, there has been building a desire amongst certain groups in the left to create an alternative. And I was lucky enough to be in January in Paris at the launch of the Plan B initiative and then in Madrid last month and the follow-up summit of that where various different groups from across Europe and mainly not in the UK, but predominantly France, Germany, Spain and Italy, have come together to say, and Greece, have come together to say, we believe we must have a future as Europeans within Europe, so not retracing our steps into some sort of proto-nationalist past. We want to be European, but we want to resist and revolt against the European treaties. Now, the way they've put that allows for quite a broad spectrum of opinion of exactly what you mean there. And in fact, in Paris and Madrid, the main focus was on the euro and that sense of saying we will no longer be prepared to sacrifice our lives and our futures for an anti-democratic currency like the euro or, in fact, any other currency. Within the, e within the UK, of course, we've been pushed into a more fundamental debate about the, Euro the European Union itself and membership of it, and we don't have to worry about the euro itself. But what's interesting there is this much <coughs> more positive vision of working together from below, a true meaning of internationalism between peoples, between societies, to conceive of a new type of Europe, where we would be able to recover some sense of the European social model and a leadership in terms of international issues such as climate change or whatever you like to have, and break with the current technocratic, anti-democratic program that otherwise we're being subjected to. And for war on war, whatever the result of this referendum, we will continue to take part in that program because we do believe in forging these very close links with others across Europe and fighting for a better future within Europe even if not within the institutions of the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, um, for a very illuminating talk covering the historical transformation of Europe. That was very interesting to hear about the previous referendum uh, so many decades ago. Um, and I'm really talking about this open, open markets, closed borders <laughs> tactics. So very... Uh, interesting contribution. Uh, let's move on to Martin Sandbu now for our second part of the talk. Thank you very much. Um, the, the questions that we're debating tonight cover a number of different concepts. We're talking both about globalization or international economic integration and technocracy. We are talking about institutions, whether they're democratic or not, and outcomes, the policies they choose. 
Uh, those are not all the same things, and, and what I'd like to do to begin with, I think, is to maybe clarify some of these concepts, because it's very easy, I think, to be led astray if we think they all mean the same thing. Uh, if you forgive me for starting in a somewhat abstract way, I find very useful as a, as a starting point Danny Roderick's globalization trilemma, which I'm sure many of you know about, uh, but I will just go through it very quickly. Uh, Danny Roderick is an economist at Harvard um, who's at the same time very much a neoclassical economist and a bit of a hero of the anti-globalization movement. Partly because he says that you can be a mainstream neoclassical economist and see big problems with globalization, including democratic problems. He's posited a trilemma, three things that you can't have all three of at the same time. The three things being economic globalization, economic integration across borders. That's the one thing. The second thing is the nation state or national sovereignty, national self-determination. And the third thing is democracy, as, as understood as some sort of mass involvement and mass mass politics, popular influence on what the political choices are. So Roderick says, you can have globalization and the nation state, but the nation state won't be democratic because it will just follow internationally set rules. You can have globalization and democracy, but only if you have an international super state that democratically then decides things at an international level, so no nation state. Or you can have the classical democratic nation state, but then you have to give up on economic globalization. And that's putting it quite starkly. He really says you can't have all of these things to their fullest extent at the same time. I find that, as I said, a very useful conceptual starting point. Uh, I don't quite agree, and I will, I will tell you why. Uh, but it's a powerful way of thinking about things, and I think it clarifies our thinking whether or not we agree with the analysis. Now, notice, first of all, it's globalization. It's not technocracy. So I want to pause first to talk about the relationship between globalization and technocracy. Is there one, and is there necessarily one? And I tend to think that no, technocracy, although it seems to be correlated with economic globalization, they've happened at the same time. And technocratic rules seem to come with economic integration across borders, EU directives or trade rules, like the trade agreements that John was talking about. But there's no necessary link there, even if things that happen at the same time don't necessarily depend on one another. Uh, and I'd like just to remind you how neutral technocracy, technocratic rules actually are with respect to what outcomes they favor. Remember or hark back to mid-century European social democracy. For a lot of people this was the golden age, the sort of social democratic states most of Europe had in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s. That was a very technocratic sort of state. I grew up in Norway in the 80s, and I remember this. I mean, think about the Soviet Union. I mean, that was probably the most technocratic regime man has ever known. It was not democratic. And, of course, the EU is technocratic. The United States is very technocratic. Anyone who's lived in the US will just laugh at this notion that it's the home of the free and so on. Um, and I will just put it to you that even a country that isolated itself economically, to the extent that it wanted to be a modern economy at all, it would still be quite highly technocratic. Because modern economies are complex. And the way they work is by a number of standards, a number of rules that make people coordinate. That you can mention any kind of trivial example, the acceptable amount of voltage in your electricity sockets, the width of railways, the uh, 
I happen to have a three-year-old, so I'm sort of interested in the regulations governing, governing the security standards, safety standards of bicycle seats for toddlers. These things are technocratic. That doesn't mean that they're either bad in themselves. That depends on what those technocratic rules are. It depends on the content. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're undemocratic either. That depends on how they were generated, right? And are they anchored in a process that citizens feel they have some sort of control over. It's not undemocratic that it's illegal to produce certain substandard type of toddler bike seats. Okay. So technocracy would be will be with us. Uh, what we have to do is to make sure that it's democratically anchored, whether or not we integrate economically. Now, there are special challenges when this happens across borders, and we'll no doubt discuss that. But I just want to leave that as a point for now. So let's go back to globalization, specifically. Roderick's trilemma is you can't have globalization and then both of national sovereignty, national self-determination, and democracy in that self-determination. Uh, I think that's overly complicated. Uh, it, it's not obvious to me that even dictatorships that are full-on globalizers, that there are things they can do that democracies can't do. Or alternatively, if globalization binds, it's not clear that a democracy is bound any more than a non-democratic nation state. The conflict, if there is one, is really between global economic activity and setting rules at the national level, regardless of whether those rules are set democratically or not. If you could, it's a strange thought experiment, but, but if, you, if you imagined an um, authoritarian or dictatorial state being a member of the EU, I think they would feel as hemmed in as democracies do. You know, maybe imagine Turkey under its current government if it really was an EU member. It's already hemmed in by a lot of EU rules because it's in a customs union with the EU. It can't set its own tariffs. Um, but how democratic or authoritarian Turkey is becoming, I don't think changes that. Now, there is, of course, uh, a sort of definitional conflict between national self-determination and globalization. If globalization means allowing goods or services made in other countries into your own country and vice versa, if it means allowing workers from other countries into your own country, or if it means allowing capital flows from other countries into your own country, then of course by definition there are some things you nationally cannot do, namely lock those things out. So there's a definitional conflict. If you want economic activity across borders, yeah, then you can't at a national level stop that economic activity across borders. But that doesn't really get us very far, right? That doesn't get us into a deep, inherent conflict between cross-border economic activity and national self-determination. And from now on, I'll just talk about national democracy because of what I said right before, that uh, uh, it's democracy at the national level that matters. Dictatorship doesn't really get you out of this. But, but, but there are a number of other ways in which there's not so much of a conflict. So, yes, definitionally, if you have international capital flows or international worker movements or international trade in goods and services, by definition, you don't nationally block those. But you still have a national choice in the extent to which you have these things. Do you want trade in goods and services, but not free movement of workers? Do you, know that you want the opposite? Do you want capital, but not goods? Do you want capital, but not workers? Do you want workers, but not capital? And how much of these things do you want? These are gradual, these are spectra of choices, right? It's not binary. It's not economic globalization and no globalization. And where you end up on that spectrum, is a political choice. The history of the EU has been gradual choices to go towards more integration. 
and more common rules. But that doesn't mean those weren't choices. And it doesn't mean that the choice isn't available to step back from that. I mean, the fact that we are facing a referendum in the UK on whether to, rem to remain a member of the EU, I think rather proves that there's no democratic obstacle to reversing globalization. It's a choice that's there. It's even codified in the treaty, Article 50, which you've heard about. And ultimately, both the law and power remains at the national level. A country can leave when it wants to. And even if it breaks the treaties, you, know, you can withdraw from treaties. That's legal. And even if it's not, what can anyone else do? Well, they can maybe not want to trade with you, but you, know, you can't require others to do something without their collaboration. So again, there's a lot of choice there. Now, are these choices more or less democratic because they are more economically integrated? In other words, do we get less democratic the more economically integrated we are? Well, I don't think that either. Self-government is really about, it's about the degree to which you control your environment and your destiny. That's what self-government is. And I'm using the word self-government because I want to make the point that this is true at the level of states, but it's also true at the level of individuals. Right? Your own self-government is about the sort of control you have and freedom you have in your environment, economically and politically. And this is why we don't say that there's a problem of self-government, that you live in a state in the first place, right? The fact that we live in a state that where laws are voted on in a certain way, and then you have to follow them whether or not you agree with them, that's not anti-democratic, that's democracy if the process is right. So the fact that you don't decide everything yourself is obviously not a sign of the lack of democracy or lack of self-government at the level of individuals, at the level of regions within a country, or at the level of states in the international community. Of course, there can be a lack of democracy, but the, the fact of deciding things together does not mean a lack of democracy. And the fact is that most of what the European Union does is to decide things together. So the whole premise of the European Union is that we, European nation states, can decide that it's better for us all if we have common rules. Now you may agree or disagree with that. But certainly it's within the scope of national democracy to exercise that democracy by trying to sit down and make common rules with others. That is the European project. Okay? So to the extent that that is what's happening, I don't think that there's a democratic deficit. Now, that's not always what's happening. But in large part, everything that's decided in the EU has been approved by national governments, which are all democratically elected, have strong democratic mandates. It's true that actual laws formally have to be proposed by the Commission, and they are, but they will often be proposed at the request of national governments. That's the European Council. They will never become law unless they're approved by the European Council, by very large majorities, not unanimity anymore. Margaret Thatcher helped get rid of that moving to what's called qualified majority, sort of a large majority. And the reason was in order to make it easier to have common rules. And it has to be approved by the European Parliament, which has gained a lot more power after the Nice Treaty. It's true that, again, they don't initiate things, but they can request things. And in practice, they do put things in. Now, I think the most telling example is uh, the EU ban on excessive bankers' bonuses. So there's now an EU law against paying bankers more than twice, with some details, more than twice their salary as a bonus. That came from the European Parliament, the Greens in particular, who have a good team in the economic affairs area. 
it was part of what they said, we want this in order to approve other things, capital markets regulations. So maybe it was accounting, some obscure regulation. The, the government ministers, the governments in the European Council wanted to get the package through. The European Parliament said, well, you'll only get it through if you also accept this. George Osborne was very much set against it. Everybody else, every other country was for it. They voted it through. It all went through. It is the law of the land, more or less, says you know, the Bank of England and the UK is trying to get around it. This is not undemocratic, right? It's also probably a good policy, but as I said, whether or not it's a good policy is different from whether it was democratically decided. It was something that happens to go against the desire of the UK government of the day. <laughs> as part of a system to which successive UK governments have agreed to, and successive governments of all the member states have agreed to, that we should try to have rules in common on a large number of things. Again, that might be a bad idea, but that in itself has been a democratic choice. And again, of course, when you, need, when you decide to have common rules, you, you won't always get the rule you want, but you will get a rule that can get through this sort of system, and that means it must demand a majority among organs that are democratically elected, national governments and the European Parliament. <coughs> now, there are quite clearly problems. It's not quite as idyllic as I have set it out to be. That is my overall view, that this idea of a democratic deficit is a bit of a misunderstanding. Of course, things don't get decided by national governments, but that kind of goes with the territory of trying to have common rules. Okay. Uh, but things could be better. So I want to end by talking about some of the ways in which there are, let's call them democratic imperfections. <coughs> One, one is that national politicians, who are presumably, who do have democratic mandates, I suppose everyone will agree with that, um, it's very much in their interest to blame either the bureaucracy, the Brussels bureaucracy, or the, the courts, the European courts, not to mention the European Court of Human Rights, which is not part of the EU, um, for you know, obvious reasons of politics. But we should just be aware that they protest a little bit too much. There's a lot more influence national governments have or could have. There's a lot more influence national parliaments have or could have. Next time you hear parliamentarians here complain about undue influence from Brussels, ask yourselves how often the British Parliament holds the British government to account either before or after a Europe European Council meeting. For, for how it bargains with other governments. So some of this is, is just presentational. Things are presented as being less democratic than they are. But there are, there are real democratic imperfections. Like any bureaucracy, the European Commission is always eager to do more. It's always eager to do more at the European level. The principle of subsidiarity which is a principle that things should be done at the lowest possible level, uh, is not honored as it should be. But of course, you don't, necessarily, you don't see national governments using the European Court of Justice to try to stop that. So again, some of the blame here is on not using the sort of institutions that are available. There's something else that's specific, I think, about doing things across borders, which is that because for the same reason that it's hard to get things through, you need everyone's agreement or most people's agreement. It's also hard to undo things. And that is a real difference from a national government, where a new government can undo what a previous government has done because things depend on so many more players in the European Union. It's much harder to undo previous bad laws, for example. And uh, 
there are certainly things that could be improved there. You could make laws with sunset clauses, right? You could say this expires after 10 years unless it's voted back in, perhaps with amendments depending on what elected representatives in 10 years want. But again, this is something that national governments have had the ability to do and they've chosen not to. You can have a sort of spring cleaning and try to remove too much technocracy, but of course that is deregulation. Right? So that there's also, you know, you can't have, you can't both complain about technocracy and about deregulation at the same time. Better regulation is presumably what we want. And we will disagree on what the best regulation is. But that's also part of democracy, that we'll have to work that out in a political process. Now, finally, we get to that key, right? The political process. I agree with John that to a large extent, or to, to, to an excessive extent, politics has been taken out of things. Probably not as much as you think, John, but I agree um, in principle, if not in, in degree. Uh, and let's, let's take this example of the euro. Now, the euro has ended up looking a bit like a trap. Remember that it was sold to citizens of Europe on the basis of a number of promises. To the German electorate in particular, the promise was we will not have to pay money, bail out other countries if they get into trouble. There was a legal clause in there that I don't really think made it illegal, but there was certainly a political promise. Some of the other countries were promised a sort of parity with Germany that they hadn't had under the previous system of, of national exchange rates where what you found was that the independence you probably you supposedly had was the independence, the freedom to do exactly what the Bundesbank did within 15 minutes of a decision in Frankfurt. So there was a promise that by having a common central bank, everyone would actually be equal in these monetary policy decisions. Of course, what's happened is that the citizens of the Eurozone have been told that once you have the euro, the only way to make it work is to violate all of those promises. The core countries, the credited countries, have to bail the others out, and those that are bailed out have to accept diktats on their policy. That is what's played out in the crisis. That, that's an actual description of what's happened in the crisis. And it's also the intellectual vision of where the euro has to go, intellectual and political, I should say. Um, John, I think, mentioned the Five Presidents Report, a sort of official roadmap which says for the euro to really work, we also need a fiscal union, we need regular budgetary transfers, and we need a centralization of some policy choices, partly in order to justify, partly in order to secure how that money is used. So it's quite true that the direction of travel is towards less national autonomy. And because these are democracies, that means less national democracy. I don't think that is a necessary consequence of having, having a single currency. I think rather that it's the consequence of an entirely avoidable, unnecessary, but bad choice that was made early in the crisis, which was a choice to forswear the write-downs and restructuring of debts. The debts of states, such as Greece, and the debts of private banks, such as the Irish banks. The choice back in 2010 that all debts have to be honored in full set up a sort of political economy within the Eurozone that pitted creditors against debtors and mapped national nation states onto those categories. So you suddenly had a conflict between the creditor states and the debtor states. Now, there is no sovereignty for debtors that cannot service their debt in a system that doesn't allow for debts to be written down or restructured. That's not a fact about the euro. That's not a fact about economic globalization. And it's not a fact about capitalism, because 
problems with debts and problems between creditors and debtors have been with us much, much longer than capitalism has. The earliest writings, human writings, are tallies of debt. And I'm not a religious person, but I've been deeply impressed by how all the great religions have very strict rules about debt. How you can build it up, what interest rates you can charge, and the requirement to forgive debt at regular intervals. Jubilees. All the great religions have this. And that tells me that problems of debt and the sort of social havoc it can cause, a debt bubble can cause, is something that's been with us for thousands of years, and we've learnt about it and unlearnt it and had to rediscover it again and again uh, at a very high price, and the same thing has just happened. But that has nothing to do with globalization. That happens within countries, too. The problem is that the leaders of the Eurozone chose, they, they forswore the option of restructuring debts. And that set up this dependence of debtors on creditors, and that gave power to the creditors. Uh, and a lot of the things that have been imposed flow simply from that. Now you, can, you may ask, well, why, why do people impose those policies? Why is it what many of you will call neoliberal policies structural reforms, a certain vision of what the economy should look like that suddenly people on the left don't like. Well, I think it's because a lot of people believe that these are the right policies, and they use their power, abuse their power, to impose them. But the people who do this are democratically elected. So the problem we have here, if you look across the Eurozone, across, across the EU, it's parties who have tended to believe this that have won elections. So... I think uh, democracy, uh, there's much more democracy available than is being used. <laughs> to the extent that democracy is being used, it's unfortunately often, the democratic battle is often won by people who believe in bad and sometimes unjust policies. Now, I don't have a good solution to that problem except going out there and campaigning more for better policies. But what <coughs> I do believe is that undoing economic integration the euro, the EU, and putting back up national boundaries is not going to help the problem. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Martin, for an interesting overview of your, um, of your perspective on the euro crisis and the European Union. Um, certainly the theoretical frameworks are very useful, these broad uh, frameworks to try and look at concepts, to go into the meanings. Uh, of concepts, um, and I and I hope one of the things that you you raise, both of you raise, is these common rules. How do um, how do common rules get formed? Uh, what is this deciding together process? And um, I guess this jump of how was this political economy of debtors versus creditors set up in this system of common rules and deciding together? So um, thank you both very much for your uh, contributions. Uh, I'm. You know, I want to open it up to the floor to hear your questions, questions to the speakers, um, comments, short comments. We can take a round, uh, a round of three or four questions, uh, give it back to the speakers, and then continue uh, continue on this basis. So, um, do we have any uh, any burning questions on the floor? What is the sort of say you have in mind? Are you, are you sorry? Are you are you British? Just to kind of make it concrete. Yeah. yeah. So what's the sort of say you have in the British government that you don't have in the EU? Well, so obviously I can vote for the government, and yeah. they represent me in the EU. But uh, I do not have any direct say in what happens directly in the EU. Just because I can do it through the British government isn't quite the same as saying I have a direct say in the government. Did do, do you vote in the last European elections? So you wanted yeah. to take a couple of questions. I want to take a round, if that's okay. <laughs> Are there any more questions oh. um, around? 
Okay, uh, just the two of you, yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the European security mechanism. Um, wondering if you think there's a, a or it seems to be one very technocratically, the great democratic deficit, uh, not much input from the European Parliament, for example. Do you think the, what ways do you think we can improve that democratic deficit in the, in the European security mechanism? Well, you said that better regulation agenda in the EU is about deregulation, pro business, uh, not taking into account environmental or social impacts. But as far as I know, this is better regulation agenda is actually the opposite, taking actually a holistic view. And that's why they have these uh, input assessments that need to take into account all kinds of impacts that new regulations have. So we'll have to know what basis to point that on. Okay, let's um, give it to the speakers, maybe to John first and then Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since I made a full start, didn't I? Sorry. Um, well, well, but just on the first thing, Well, you obviously have some say in that you, you elect someone to the European Parliament, uh, and they are a lot more powerful than people think. Um, and, uh, you know, you can try and hold them to account as much as you would hold your Westminster MP uh, to account. I don't know what you do if your Westminster MP isn't the one you voted for, or if they do something you don't like. Um, and these are problems in any kind of democracy, right? Now, I, I accept the distance is much further. I, of course, of course it is. But I don't see how you get around that. If you think it's good for Europeans to try to have some common rules. Now, you may not think that. In which case, <coughs> sure, you might, you know, it might be better to just decide everything locally rather than in some sort of horse trading compromise between national politicians you know, with the input from the Commission that will try to broker something that they think can go through. They'll obviously push as much as they can for what they want. That's politics. But, but I don't see how you get around that if you think it's a good idea to have common rules, right? If you have common rules, then others will have a say too, and your say will be, you know, proportionally, if you like, way less. Um, but you can't say that that is less democratic. You can say it's the wrong way to go to make common rules with others. We should all have separate rules, and you happy to take the consequences of that. I wouldn't be. I think it makes sense to have a lot of common rules. Um, but if you think, you, if you want common rules, I'm not sure how, you know, in a bigger, a larger governed space, well, yeah, the distances will be longer. We should do everything we can to minimize that distance, but, yeah, a space of 500 people is, you know, it's harder to govern than a space of uh, 50 million. Um, on, on the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, that's the, that's the sort of fund through which Eurozone states have bailed out Greece and Ireland and Portugal and Cyprus. Um, I think it was wrong to bail them out to begin with, because what that does is to create this creditor-debtor relationship between nation states, which is harmful politically toxic. It's been poisoned. So I don't think we should have had it in the first place. Well, once you have it, well, naturally, it is a tool for enforcing the conditions of the creditors. So, yeah, no, in that sense, it's not very democratic. But again, that has to do with how a, debtor a debt can reduce sovereignty. That, that's a bad thing, I agree. Can I come back on this as well? I mean, to go to the first thing, I do disagree with Martin in respect to this question of um, an automatic sort of comparison between our voting for parties here and our voting in the European space. And I had this sort of absolutely bitter experience of beating my head for 20 years against the European Union's trade policy and finding exactly this problem. When we vote people back to Westminster, we each vote in our constituencies. So I'll vote in Wandsworth, you'll vote in Richmond, somebody else will vote in Harrogate, we vote that out. But we're voting for the same parties on the list. And that means that if together we all vote for these parties, they will then form the government. That's not the same. In either the European Council, where we get one, we have to vote for one group, 
if even if we have the best UK government, actually let's not use the UK because we'll never get a really very good one. But let's say the Greek people, but for some reason, and everyone goes yes, or indeed the. The, the Spanish vote for Podemos, and the Portuguese vote for the left bloc, and the French vote for the Parti de Gauche, and we can all, you know, dream. Even then, you find that they don't have the power to stand up to the other ones. So we are disenfranchised at that level. Within the European Parliament, it's much, much worse. And we've done this literally for the last year, trying to push people on the TTIP resolution, which was before the European Parliament in July of last year. And we put huge pressure on the Labour MEPs and we managed to get them to shift their position. So we you know, had the, full, the fullest impact in terms of our democratic accountability of our MEPs. But the German Social Democrats and the Italians had already done a deal to form their own grand coalition with the Conservatives and the Liberals. So they said, we don't care about your views. And they managed to swish all of it through. And we have absolutely no say over them whatsoever. And this is, I think, about more than just a distinction of, of distance. This is about a structural <coughs> inability to control, which, would, which is different from here. Yes, here we have 650 MPs from all different parts of the country. The Tories are about to make it 600 so that they can get rid of some of the Labour ones. And then they're part of the same system. That's the difference, I think. We can't vote for the Finnish or the Latvian, or the Maltese representative. They are all from different parties. We have no participation in that. So that's a bit of a difference there. The, the ESM, interestingly, I think there, it was precisely this which was being discussed within the context of the um, Plan B debates in Madrid and Paris. And here I think it's really important to remember, it's not just really about the international relations between creditor states and debtor states. The bailout that went to the Greek to Greece went straight yeah. out again. Ninety percent went straight back to the German banks and the French banks. So it's not actually Germany bailing out Greece; it's the people of Europe bailing out the banks again. That's my right. In exactly the same the same way again, which happened with Ireland. And with Ireland, you had an absolutely stark choice. You had a government which was considering forcing the bondholders to take a haircut, as they say, so that actually you're putting a bit of pain on those who are just speculating and making more and more money out of the accumulation of capital. And it was the Troika which came in and said, no way. Who is the Troika? The IMF, unelected, unaccountable. The European Central Bank, unelected, unaccountable. The European Commission, unelected, unaccountable. And that is a recipe for complete anti-democratic <coughs> nightmare. And that's what the Irish people have to do. So the Irish people get told, you will bear the brunt of this, pain of it's all going to go on you through permanent austerity, and all of the bankers can continue buying yachts and villas in the Bahamas until they can't get enough. Until the, the, the better just quickly okay. come back on better regulation agenda, which we actually know through the uh, the fact that it was the Labour Party which originally coined the concept of better regulation here, and they set up a better regulation executive within the um, Cabinet Office, which is the sort of gatekeeper of all legislation going through. And whenever you had legislation which looked as if it was going to introduce new rules, they stopped because they said better regulation is about reducing the burden. And that's exactly the same language which has been used by the European Commission, and particularly this new way of saying that for every one euro of additional burden of regulation on business, if you introduce a rule which would be worth one euro of regulation, you have to have two taken away. So this constant reducing of the burden. And that seems to me to be a complete reversal of what was there before within the European Union, where it was genuinely saying, let's look around for a levelling up. Now what we're being told, absolutely explicitly by our government, is that it's not about raising standards. In order to be competitive, you have to reduce the burden on business. And that's what we've seen certainly through the Global Europe Agenda of the Trade Treaties, but now absolutely explicitly through TTIP, they're saying, yeah, it would be possible if you started with a different logic 
to have a positive outcome of this. If we were negotiating TTIP with our brothers and sisters from the USA, we would start by saying, ramp up all of the standards and the regulations. And exactly as Martin says, on globalization, we would say, well, we want to do it in a different way. We're not saying North Korea is a great model for anybody to follow, but we are saying that we can determine the terms and conditions under which we trade and invest. And the technocratic revolution is not about technical choices. It's about the rule of that deregulation approach, the, the, the transformation so that the political discussion about whether you should or shouldn't have these terms and conditions on capital gets swept away. And then just a tiny sort of example of that. Whenever we talk to the promoters, the proponents of TTIP, they say, well, look, we're talking about a technical revolution. In the European Union, if you have a washing machine, the flex which connects it to the electricity has to be one meter long. In the USA, it's a yard long, which is that different. And they're saying, we want to have this trade agreement to iron out that difference. And you say, knock yourselves out. You know, you don't need, you don't need to have a massive great big trade treaty. Just cut it in two, half the difference. Nobody cares. It's not the point. What they're actually talking about is GMOs. Big discussions about whether or not we should have GMOs in, in Europe. 70% of all processed food in the USA in their supermarkets contains GM ingredients. And people in Europe don't want it. But that's technocracy, because the, Europe, the US is saying, under free trade, you don't get to choose. Hormones in beef. 90% of all US beef is produced using growth hormones. They're banned in Europe because they're carcinogenic. The US say, no, 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 under science-based rules, technocracy, you don't get to choose. Get with the program. We eat it, you eat it. And there's masses and masses of examples like that. So I think that's technocracy is where you move from the washing machine flex to the key issues of how we will control trade and investment so that it is to use the Polanyer, Polanyan, what is the adjective? Polanyan. Polanyan. Polanyan, for Karl Polanyi's term, you embed it within our social mores. You don't let it sort of float off into its own um, free-floating world of capital. It's, you know, anyway. Thank you. Can, you can I follow on? Yes, of course. And uh, we can then go back to any more comments and questions. Yeah. Look, I, I think you, you too often conflate a lack of democracy with outcomes you don't like. Not always, but sometimes. But I'll start with one of the points you make where we agree the most, I think, which is the Irish case. Uh, it's quite true. Ireland was forced to bail out its banks after it had voluntarily done so for a while, but it was starting to change, and it was told uh, it shouldn't do that. Interestingly, the IMF is the hero of this story because the IMF was trying to say, no, no, this has to be written down but kind of let itself be overruled by the others. The villain is the ECB. Mm. And here, I agree, there is a real problem of democracy in how the European Central Bank has acted. Because time and time again, in the Eurozone crisis, the European Central Bank has said, you have to do this or that, far beyond the mandate they've been given, which is a democratically given mandate, but into decisions about fiscal redistribution, structural reforms, and in particular, this question of whether you should bail out the banks. Um, and the threat, because think about this. So in Ireland in 2010, it was, it was sort of golden shackles, right? If you want a bailout, you need to accept these conditions. But why did they accept a bailout? In the, up until the sort of last day, the Irish government said, well, we don't want it, and we don't need it, because we don't need to borrow any money for it. It was something like six months or ten months. And, and I remember at the time writing leaders for the FT saying they shouldn't, right? They should mm. write down the debt in the banks. Uh, it wasn't obvious at the time, but it's become clear later that what happened was that the European Central Bank said, you do this or we'll cut off all funding to your banks, we'll kill your banking system. The same threat happened in Portugal a couple of months later. It happened in Cyprus, although with the opposite sign. In Cyprus they said, unless you write down <laughs> the credit is in your banks, we will kill your banking system. So in that, in that, it was undemocratic, but it was the right policy, in my view. Uh, and of course in Greece, 
last year, it was very much it was very much that. Greece could there would have been a lot of pain, but they could have said, well, we're just going to default. The much more difficult thing would be that it seemed like the European Central Bank might then just kill the whole banking system, and with that you sort of kill the economy. So I agree that the ECB has vastly abused its powers. It's got better, uh, but that is a big problem. <coughs> of course, it did happen because the countries let themselves get into those debt relationships, but, but I agree, that's undemocratic. But your other example, so the Labour MEPs and, and TTIP, I'm sorry, you just didn't have the numbers, right? The German Social Democrats are less democratic than the UK no, Labour Party. We don't have any access to them. I think that was. But you don't, but Germans do. Yeah, we're working with them all the time. Very good. But <laughs> us, then. That's the it's, issue. It, but it's, they're not, it's, but they're it's, not part of it's not undemocratic that UK activists, or even the UK Labour Party, can't decide the European policy if you think there should be a European policy. It is a constriction of our democracy. That's the thing. Okay, let's put it in a, sorry to interrupt your, in this point, um, perhaps the question is about whether we are as free and equal against these rules and in making these rules as we would like to think, because I think that's one of the things I can distinguish, is whether all, of, all social groups have equal power in creating the rules, and for example, um, a s small activist group has the same representation in creating uh, the common rules that we all decide together as, for example, the massive lobbyists or the big corporations in deciding the rules. And I think this has been one of the issues that has been uh, at the centre of the, some of this, how EU policy is actually created. And uh, perhaps there's this sense of um, what accessibility do different social groups have to those kind of rule-making processes in the EU. So I'm just uh, perhaps teasing out something there uh, about this issue. Um, is it okay if we go back to the floor to see if there's any more comments and questions. So we have two. Yeah, let's start with the back. Yeah, it was just on the point that was just being made about whether these are our representatives. Because I don't think that problem, if it is a problem, is unique to Europe. Because if you're voting in Scotland at the moment, you overwhelmingly vote for a party that can vote any way it likes in our British national party. But ultimately, if the majority government, which is effectively English, votes the other way, Scotland's voice is appeared. And I just wonder whether that's an inevitable consequence, as Martin was saying, of pooling your democracy in a larger area. The less likely it is that your local view will be positive. Yeah. A uh, question about the transparency in the council. Uh, there's 28 member states at the moment, and as John pointed out, the UK only has one vote over there. But because a lot of the host trading done is done behind closed doors and not shown in the minutes later on who suggested what or how did they vote, uh, there's a problem of showing accountability to the national executives representing their peoples in the council. Do you have any more comments or ideas or questions for our speakers? Yep. speech to stay in is because I think of the history that we've got. So I think Martin was 
which mm. is not in the EU. So it's like a whole thing where we were in Geneva recently with um, the W, uh, with WIPO and the WEU and various other groups that were um, talking about TTIP. Farage was saying that TTIP was something that we shouldn't be really, really involved in because it was very much like the EU and he was saying it was all corrupt and what we needed to do was have bilateral agreements with nation states that we were capable of doing it like Switzerland, that we were capable of doing it like uh, Norway and, and Finland. But for some reason there seems to be all this fear. If the pound went down, there were people saying that there was going to be lots of car exports, you know, all trade's going to be affected. So what is the reality? Should we have this fire in our belly that we should be maintaining our rules and maintaining our laws? Or should we be doing what our learned comrade here is saying, which is that we've got this system, what we perhaps need to do is fix it, and how do we go about making those reforms? What do we need to do before June that referendum to be in? It's a big one. <laughs> Can I step back a little? Because that. Can I go backwards through the question? Of course, as you like. Um, because on that one, I think it's a really good point. George Galloway, for interest, used to do my job at War Month. He was the director of War Month um, back in the day. Mm. And um, it, it was quite funny because he was on the Daily Politics show on BBC just after that event, uh, having an absolute ding dong with the BBC reporter, George Galloway, who kept on saying, Everybody left when you started speaking. And he said, I'm not here to discuss ridiculous little things like that. I'm here to discuss the EU referendum. So we had a real fight. And I was on immediately afterwards. It was really terribly, yeah, terribly difficult. Um, how do we fix it? And I think that's absolutely right. The people who are looking from the perspective of wanting to stay in, certainly most people, most people from the left, and I think most people from all sides, are saying there is something fundamentally wrong in the European Union. And then the question is, do you believe it is reformable? Do you believe you can fix the institutions? And that's the big question which we're asking people. Because you get a lot of people from the more liberal, green, left side who will say, we've got to be in it to fix it. And it sounds lovely. But if you've actually had the hard experience of trying to shift those institutions, you will know that actually there is a solid block at the centre of Europe which is unreformable. And that's interesting because more and more people are seeing that about the Euro. Certainly the Plan B stuff is saying the Euro is unreformable. It's structurally committed towards the supremacy of Germany for the detriment of everybody else. So we need to have what they're saying now is, is, is a, a shift back to some form of the exchange rate mechanism from before, or some sort of virtual thing where you have parallel currencies or back to national currencies, whatever it may be. But they're all saying you have to, you have, to have a rupture with the institutions to create the space for something positive. And I think that's the debate, really. Do, if you believe that the institutions are reformable, then I think that's a very compelling reason to vote in. But if you think that they're just genuinely not, because the treaties of the European Union as set out preclude that option, then you've got a different a different response. The UKIP stuff's fascinating on TTIP. UKIP love TTIP. They love the fact that it's anti labour, it's anti the environment, it's against public health, it's against public safety. They love everything in it. They just hate the fact that it's Brussels negotiating it and not Westminster. And I won't go on too much about TTIP because you've raised everybody. Uh, you can raise everybody. Um, transparency, to go back sort of in the reverse order of things. Um, would it be, it would certainly help. I mean, we, I remember when they were having the debates on the WTO, the World Trade Organization, about 10 years ago, um, and it was then the new Labour government. And they would say to us in these very sort of heart to heart meetings, we've really been pushing absolutely hard for all the things you've been saying in council. And then we get all these reports from all of the other countries saying, the UK government did exactly the opposite. They're absolutely lying through their teeth. And of course the great thing about these untransparent bodies is that they can just submerge everything. Um, we have a nice, very, very luckily, we have access to some of the cables which come out intergovernmental, intra-governmental cables from other countries so we can see the positions being taken. 
mm. by government. Not to mention the FT's fine Brussels Bureau. The <laughs> excellent FT Brussels Bureau, without which I'm sure that there will be even less transparency in the European Union. Varoufakis is pushing for transparency. This is, it's a thing at the basis of his DM25, <coughs> Democracy in Europe movement by 2025. You know, it's, one of, it's the lowest possible thing you can push for. It won't really, I think, make any difference. But it's, it's a nice thing. But I don't think it's really good. <laughs> can I just insert my thoughts on, yeah, on this particular yeah. question? Because I, I, I agree, more transparency would be great. I'm sceptical that it would be workable if you did make public these discussions. The real discussions would happen elsewhere. People would find a way around it. That's not a reason not to do it. I just want to note that UK cabinet meetings are not public, right? You can't go to the cabinet or the government website and see the streaming of the cabinet meeting. Mm. Um, yeah, is that undemocratic? You can see the argument for keeping the conversation private. Uh, I don't know that it's undemocratic. I think it'd be a good thing with more transparency. I work for a newspaper. We'd love it. But you can see the but, but But it's not... Yeah, no, so, absolutely. So I'm just saying this, this, doesn't, this isn't any different at the Westminster level or the Brussels level. If, if anything, it's more transparent in Brussels precisely because you have so many opposing interests. It's not a team of collective responsibility. But the Tories, I don't care whether Ian Duncan Smith agrees with David Cameron who doesn't agree with Michael Gove. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. But you get one thing out of the Conservative government who you voted for, or in most cases have, or in some cases have. And Mm. You know, you, you can see what it is. So there is a direct line there. I can hold every single one of them around the table responsible. And in the EU Council, that's the problem. I can only... I have, I have absolutely no democratic route to the Latvian government. That's my problem. And it does go back to your question around the Scots nationalists, for example. And I think it's exactly the same sort of principle. Um, if the Scots nationalists were to hold, you know, to stand... Um, candidates in all of the seats all the way across Britain, and indeed the north of Ireland, um, then it would be a different situation. They've decided just to sort of run in Scotland, and therefore they are, to an extent, exposed in that way. Um, so I do see that that is the same, the same sort of problem, whereas if you're looking within Holyrood, and, and the election which will come on the 5th of May um, for the Scottish Parliament, then it's a slightly different issue. Um, but again, you know, you can then, within your constituency, and indeed within a fairly big bulk of Britain, you can vote in that way. But I think that the tensions are exactly the same tensions, and that's what was reclaimed in the Scottish referendum. Um, and maybe it is. I mean, that's one of the other things that Polanyi really did say, that the more you get this integration within bigger and bigger spaces, the further away it is from people, exactly as you were saying, Martin. So there is a sort of a physical thing in that respect. And it is a real physical thing. We, we, we do take demos to Brussels. Mm. And, you know, we have pe people going and protesting in Brussels. But it's a great deal easier to take people to the Tory conference in Manchester, like last year, than to get everybody schlepping over to <laughs> Brussels. Um, and, I, you know, I suppose it's the same thing as if you're in Indiana and you've raised a little militia to try and fight the federal government. It's easier to do it locally and to all step off to Washington, D.C. Uh, Just on the, on the Scotland comparison, I mean, I think this is it's a good point. I think it's partly made worse by the U.K. electoral system. With, with PR, they would probably have a bit more say um, because some coalition would have to be formed and so on. But the, the problem, if you look at Scotland, or well, the question is, do you expect that consistently in the long run, there'll be very diverging preferences among most Scots and most English on what the common rules should be to such an extent, consistently and diverging enough that it's better not to have common rules at all, in which case the obvious solution is independence. If you don't think that, and, and, and that's kind of parallel in the European case, you need to decide, well, how important is it for us to have common rules. You know, maybe we shouldn't have common rules at all the detail levels we have now. There should be more subsidiarity. But on the whole, do you want a commonly governed space or not? If you think that's a good thing, then you make it as democratic as you can. But you, know, you can't really overcome the distance. And you certainly can't say that because one country's 
one political movement in one country can't tip the outcome, that that's a democratic problem. That means everyone has to unite at the activism level too. Uh, the, uh, what, what, has to be, what has to be done for the vote to go in? Um, there are two very different kinds of conservatism. Right? You, you said you're a conservative. So there, there, are two, there are two very different kinds. I think every conservative party in the world struggles with this. There's a, uh, a sort of conservatism of, of tradition and how one used to govern oneself. And there's a conservatism of largely economic, individual freedom, including economic freedoms. The trading conservatism, if you like, with the tradition conservatism. Every conservative party struggles with that, that tension. Uh, so I guess you need to know which one you think is more important. But to the extent that, uh, like many conservatives, you do believe in, in a lot of economic integration with other countries, a lot of trade, uh, then it seems to me that you would want to... Democracy is about maximizing the influence you can have on the conditions under which that trade happens. The Norway option certainly is not that. That's accepting all the rules without any say. You know, some sort of free trade arrangement. You could probably have more national autonomy, but you would also cover less trade. You know, if it's most both TTIP and bilateral, most bilateral trade treaties have, you know, the, there is an undemocratic element, which is these uh, state investor dispute <coughs> bodies. I think national courts are much better, but that's something one can negotiate. The, I just reread, it was, re it was sort of uh, circulating inside the FT, the leader article that the Financial Times wrote in 1975 about the referendum that the FT was for staying inside, uh, the same now. But what was interesting was just how much of that full length, you know, all the way down the page leader article could run it pretty much exactly the same today, maybe remove the replace uh, the reference to the Soviet Union with a reference to Putin. But there was one thing that was included then that I haven't seen in the debate now, and that was the idea that the UK has a contribution to make. It's not only self-interest, it's also a sense of the common interest of Europe to which any great nation, and indeed any small nation, may have a contribution to make. That question hasn't been raised in this debate. Um, does no, the UK... Nobody, nobody could claim that now with a serious face. Does, does the UK... Well, <laughs> given the history, it's hard. But uh, as individual mm. citizens, I think everyone needs to ask themselves, well, is there a responsibility for the UK here too? It's usually the other way around, I think, now, that people feel that it would be the greatest gift that the British people right. give to the people of Europe is to leave the European Union. Ask not what you can do for <laughs> Europe, but what Europe can do for you. Mm. Yep. I think Boris Johnson has a lot in common with Donald Trump, <laughs> not just the hair. Uh, Don, uh, Boris Johnson's a lot smarter than Donald Trump and a lot more knowledgeable. Uh, he is, of course, a U.S. citizen and bred in Brussels. You know, he's a citizen of the world. Uh, but what he has in common with uh, with Donald Trump, I think, is a, is a nonchalance, to put it mildly, with the truth in the service of his own positioning. Uh, it's, it's very clearly established that, uh, and he's admitted it himself, that Boris Johnson used his telegraph career to write outrageous stories about Brussels. There's this funny story about how he once arrived late to a press briefing and said, so what's going on and how is it bad for Britain? <laughs> um, he's he spouted a lot of false claims, okay? Uh, so I wouldn't take anything he says particularly seriously. And, and I also think that, you know, he probably wants to have a profile, mm -hmm. high-profile role in the No campaign, the Leave campaign, but he <coughs> probably wants then, as he has sort of said, to negotiate another way of staying in. Um, so, no, I wouldn't believe the claim about three million jobs because I wouldn't believe any of his claims. But I also wouldn't believe any claim about three million jobs either way. I mean, mm. Nick Clegg has made similar points on the other side. We just don't know. It could be a bit, you know, short term, probably not so good, long term, nobody knows. 
generally I tend to think that it's bad for economics to divide things up and erect barriers rather than the opposite. So my take is it's probably bad economically, but it's, it's a political question. Okay, um, I'd, thanks very much. I just wanted to um, just draw something out which has been talked about um, by both of you and by people on the floor, which is um, the common starting point seems to be this general what is the EU slash what could the EU be versus what did we actually see in practice since the EU crisis, crisis management um, started being unroll, uh, unfolding. And um, I think we both, there is a sort of common agreement that the crisis management, uh, management in inverted commas, because the situation has definitely deteriorated, um, has been done in an undemocratic way or has been done in ways which uh, isn't going to be, uh, which leaves much to, uh, to be desired. And we've already talked about the ECB's mandate being overstepped through pressure, direct or indirect, on national governments to accept bailout mechanisms. Um, using the threat of uh, the financial system uh, being deprived of liquidity, the banking system being deprived of liquidity. Um, we've talked about how the, the stopgap measures, which then end up being t permanently in instituted as the ESM, uh, being derived from this, from this wrong decision, what was, what was the wrong decision to bail out the banks via the states, so give money to the government so the governments can pay their creditors, which at the time were the big private European banks. Um, so this was a wrong decision from which then we can see all of these undemocratic problems playing out on the EU level. So I think the, th the, um, uh, the thing that I want to sort of draw out is, well, why did that wrong decision happen uh, in the sense that we have seen numerous times EU... Uh, for, let me give you an example. When the, when the debt restructuring programme for Greece was being decided between 2011 and 12, which was then the notorious referendum proposal by Papandreou fell through, and a technocratic government was put in place... So here we have this divide between technocratic bureaucrats in Brussels and domestic civil servants versus technocratic governments being put in place, uh, I'll admittedly, or by what many people thought was the creditors themselves, in order to carry forward these agreements. Um, so uh, at that point, we had banking um, sector interest, the IAF, actually helping to break the deadlock of those policymakers about what that agreement should be. So how do we understand these negotiating powers coming to secure a new deal for the second bailout for Greece? Um, the, let's say the bankers' union very much helped to provide the blueprint for what that restructuring would be. How do we understand the deadlock arising at the European uh, political level being helped and assisted by um, financial interests directly? So I have, a, I have this question. How is this to be understood? Uh, and how is it to be understood this, um, we've been talking a lot about technocracy, the benefits of technocracy when we're talking about, you know, leave it up to the technocrats to decide the length of the cable. Um, but we have had a series of examples in the last few years of technocratic governments being put in place. And a lot of political instability, there have been five or six governments coming and going in Greece in the space of six years. Um, and... In the last case, the political will of that, of that government being very harshly resisted by the European authorities. So in what frame can we understand sovereignty, uh, popular mandates, the ECB's power to, um, you know, when we're talking about, again, in the context of the referendum, under what conditions will England be voting in, the UK be voting in? Greece voted um, the refer their referendum with the banks closed and capital controls. That had been enforced by the ECB cutting liquidity. So what are the frames of democracy? Under what conditions do, are we free to choose our uh, futures if the banks are closed and um, there's, no, uh, there's no money in the ATM? So uh, just to open it out and to kind of draw out these issues again from the discussion, I don't know if uh, you would like to comment on this or if uh, we have more issues, more, more uh, points from the floor. I can say a few words um, because you or someone in the audience also earlier asked about whether there's sort of free and equal influence among various groups in society. I think this is related. The answer is clearly no. And that, that's a flaw in national democracies too. You know, electoral democracy doesn't mean equal influence by all citizens, unfortunately. Um, Maybe one question to ask is about the Papandreou story. So, so what happened was that uh, Papandreou sprung it as a bit of a surprise on both other European countries and I think his own 
government, if I remember right, mm. that he would have a referendum on the second bailout that had a debt restructuring in it, early November 2011. And he was sort of called in schoolmasterly by Merkel and Sarkozy, who yelled at him and said, you can't do this, and so on. But I, th I think it's important to ask the question, this was still the elected prime minister of Greece. There's no question that he had the authority legally to call a referendum. He, he chose not to, right? So why did he choose not to? Well, there's obviously pressure from the outside. A big part of it was that it seems like he was stabbed in the back by, uh, by Venizelos, who I guess was the finance minister at the time, who wanted the top job himself. There was a lot of internal politicking. Um, but ultimately, he chose to withdraw it, and he lost his parliamentary support, and a new government was voted in or supported with a majority in parliament. Right? The scandal in Italy around the same time where Berlusconi was squeezed out, again, there was outside pressure, but he lost his parliamentary support. So these were terrible pressures against democracy, but still it was national politics that kind of called the day. It was that the horse trading that happens between politicians at the national level, whoever the power brokers are who aren't necessarily the same as the elected people in elected office, decided to side with the preference of the larger European countries. Why was that? Well, two questions. Why did they do that and why did the larger European powers pressure for just that? Um, and I think the role of banks is very important. I think what we have is democratically elected governments very often following the interest of banks. It's quite true. Um, and let me offer a heretical thought. There's a reason why national governments so often act in the interest of, of their banks. It's because national banking systems and national political elites are very much intertwined at the national level. Okay, Most banks in Europe are nationally headquartered banks. They have long-standing relationships. These are people who know each other. Banks are sometimes formally, sometimes informally seen as some extension of national policy, credit policy. It's very powerful to be able to channel funding the direction you want. And you see it at the most egregious level in places like Ireland and Spain, uh, where you had these huge property bubbles that benefited both banks and the parties in power while it lasted. The heretical thought I want to offer then is that the movement towards greater integration of banking regulation in Europe at the pan-European level, Eurozone and most of the EU, which is both technocratic, mm. it's supranational, uh, is actually going to have the effect, or at least it's our best hope, for breaking that nexus at the national level between national political elites and national banking elites. Mm because it will stop governments from favoring their own banks, and it will also stop the banks from favoring their own governments. That's part of the purpose. So here's an example I would like to suggest, we'll see how it plays out, where more European technocracy will actually improve national democracy. Can I give exactly the opposite position? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Because I think that it's not just at the national level. Obviously, for, for, for many sort of um, uh, neoclassical economists, they, they, they want to sort of remove that national level linkage. But they don't necessarily see the transnational capitalist class working with exactly the same level of interconnectedness. And I think that's where it's not that technocracy isn't political it's that it has the appearance of not being political. So what technocracy does is it imposes a particular solution as if it is the only solution that you could possibly hold, which would be economically sustainable, legitimate, you know, establishment or whatever. And I think that that's part of the issue. It was interesting in the Plan B discussions, everybody was saying you need to re-establish national central banks in the way in which they were originally conceived, i.e. Mm -hmm. being institutions which are political, so brought back under political control, not with this semblance of independence, and instead 
that they are responsible for managing national debt. So that becomes a way in which you do it. And it could well be in the more, in the more extreme ways, like Ecuador, for example, take an extra EU example, went through exactly that, went through a debt audit, wrote down its debt, straight back again. Mm -hmm. You know, Argentina with a slightly different model, a very, very short period of pain, and straight back again, which obviously, from the outside, everybody was screaming at Greece to say, default, 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 go through the pain and come out again on the other side. But there were obviously different political and historical things there. And I think that, you know, to go back to the bigger question, under what conditions are we voting here? In a way, Britain is voting in a position of incredible privilege in our referendum in comparison to Greece. You know, all of the aspects, we're not going to a situation where we go to the bank and there's no money in the ATM. We're not being told you have 40 euros a week or whatever it may be you can take out. Um, and we also have absolutely no conception here of the reality of the refugee presence that there is in the rest of Europe. Even, I mean, I was in Frankfurt the week before last, and even on the, 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 the platforms of Frankfurt Station, you've got a huge physical presence of, of people who come out of the, the war zones and stuff. Britain is incredibly cocooned mm. from the rest of Europe in that respect. So I think we're, we're, we're voting in a position of great privilege. And I hope that by continuing the debate, we begin to see some of the more profound choices that actually are coming in in, in the European context. OK. Um, that's a nice close. Uh, how, are there any final comments or questions? Any uh, burning uh, desires or questions for the speakers? If there's one. tried to say from a war of one, is if you were thinking, if people suggest that by leaving the European Union things are going to get better, that's a myth. Because we have the most rapidly neoliberal government and indeed country of all the European countries. So I don't think anybody needs to feel that there's a, a great choice I'm offered here. You're either in the European Union and it's going you know, to hell in a handcart, or you're in the UK and it's going to hell in a handcart. And it's just a question of whether you feel you've got any control of it, which is really the big thing. So I think that on that basis, nobody should be under any false illusion. But I do think that there is a, there is a, a necessary handing over of sovereignty as part of the UK's membership of the European Union. Because with the Treaty of Lisbon and all of the previous treaties, more and more powers are indeed ceded to Brussels. 
So the work which I do on the trade and investment policy, Britain no longer has a trade and investment policy. Britain's relations with the rest of the world are no longer a matter for our government. It's all rooted through Brussels. So I think you'll find that more and more of those things, which traditionally have seemed pretty obscure, pretty distant, they might deal with some of the profits of a big multinational corporation, but people haven't seen them really as being our issues, are now being made much more real. Because it's precisely cases like these investment courts where US corporations, if TTIP goes through, will be able to sue the UK government for introducing rules to try and stop people smoking. We don't have any control of That's something which has gone through Brussels. And my final comment on all of this is this. I had a private meeting with the European Commissioner on Trade in her office in Brussels. And I said to her, you know, everybody's against you on this. The whole of Europe's against you. You have this consultation. You've got 150,000 people responded to your consultation. Over 97% said they didn't like what you're doing. What legitimacy do you have? And she said, I do not take my mandate from the European people. And that is the commission. That is it. That is the power we've given to them. And yes, there are secondary checks and balances. It goes through the European Parliament. And the European Parliament has a take it or leave it vote. They're not allowed to get involved in any of the negotiations. But the power that we've given is a massive transfer of sovereignty. So I don't think we can escape that. It's then just a question of whether you feel that you can get enough back and whether indeed you consider it to be worth giving up your sovereignty. On a very legal level, I think you're quite right on, on sovereignty. Parliament could abolish the European Communities Act today. You can legally leave treaties, and of course there is a provision in the EU treaty for leaving. So legally speaking, sovereignty is, is in Parliament. In a narrow political sense, I agree with you. Of course, a lot of decisions aren't made there. They're made in the Commission, in the European Council, in the European Parliament, and with all kinds of political processes, formal and informal, including your lobbying <laughs> with the Commission, right? That's all part of politics. And uh, because these are common rules, they happen at a common level. So in that sense, there is, in that narrow political sense, there is less national sovereignty. But I think what matters most is this notion of sovereignty as governing yourself, right? Self-government. Um, surely that's what both the legal and political notions are for in the end, right? It's to have influence over the world around you and the lives we live. And it's often the case that by binding ourselves to certain rules, we enhance our self-government. I mean, that's the, when technocracy is done well, that's how it works. It gives predictability. It means that everyone knows what to expect. It means that you know that you won't get a, you won't be electrocuted by a washing machine. You took the washing machine example, right? But that's because of technocratic rules that have been put in place. You don't actually have to be an electrician to check whether it's safe, right? Technical rules, not technical rules. Well, but, you know, technical rules are governed by technocracy. That's what technocracy means. Not really. I think that's the I do agree with you that technocracy is political. Of course it's political, because it affects real power relations. But sometimes binding ourselves to rules, sometimes, not always, but sometimes binding ourselves can enhance our self-government when we enter agreements with one another, when we make commitments for the long term, when we make promises. We enable ourselves to do things together that we couldn't otherwise do. And of course, national democracy in some ways restricts what we can individually do, that's what laws are, but it enhances our control over our life together. So the, the real question is, in the world as it is today, does the UK have more of that real influence on how things go by being a member of the European Union or not? That's what the question has to be. And I think at 
At a more general level, do you have more self-government by making rules together with others? To me, the answer seems overwhelmingly yes. Then the question to ask, well, does the EU, as it is actually constituted, really existing European integration, as it were, does it carry out that possibility in a satisfactory way? Not the best possible way, of course. It needs to be improved. I don't think the sort of reforms the government called for were necessarily good ones. But they illustrate one thing, which is how much influence the UK actually does have. Mm. The government decided to spend all its political capital on getting concessions, supposedly, in these four domains. Those were not huge, but they took a lot to get, right? It was a huge hassle for everybody else who has a Eurozone crisis and a migration crisis and Ukraine on their hands. Mm. I mean, it was totally unnecessary. But he got it, right? And if you look back, and you actually look at what happens rather than what's reported in most of the press, the UK has had a lot of influence over the way the EU has gone. But the single market was, to a large extent, Margaret Thatcher's achievement. So, you might not agree with how that influence was used, but that's a different question from whether there's a loss of real sovereignty, real self-government. I think there's a lot of more enhanced self-government by working together. And, well, whether the governments over the years have used that influence in a wise way, that's for citizens to judge. But don't blame the structures for that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, let's give a round of applause to our uh, speakers. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I think we achieved the primary aim, which was to educate ourselves and to educate uh, all of us here on these issues and to have the time to really sit and go into these uh, both um, very practical real politic issues, but these broader theoretical and philosophical notions and the content of the notions that get thrown around uh, every day. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you again very much to our speakers for being here and to the Open Economic Forum for hosting the event. Um, and a small uh, uh, shout out for the next event of Open Economics Forum is in two weeks on um, changing UK, uh, uh, on challenging current UK policies. Uh, it's co-organised with the Economics Department at SOAS and the International Initiative for the Promotion of Political Economy. It will be taking place in this room. Um, so if you look onto the o Open Economics Forum's um, site, you'll see notification of it. So. Uh, please take some um, documents that we have, uh, which are from both of our speakers, representing some good um, descriptions of uh, some of the problems we've been talking about today. And thank you again uh, to the speakers for coming and to you for, for being here as well. Fantastic. Yeah, it's been a real privilege. <laughs> I, I hadn't expected actually to say so unequivocally that uh, you could something get better by going by leaving. From, from your earlier remarks, I wasn't sure where you stood on that. Oh, no, 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 no.